Question. Mhm. Mit die anders haben lassen.
Hi, hello everyone, and welcome to this uh, EAPSE webinar. Uh, first, I need to mention that uh, the webinar will be telecasted live on Facebook and uh, will be recorded. My name is uh, Jan V. Nielsen. I'm a member of the board of the Danish group of EAPSE, and uh, I will be your moderator today on this presentation named full-scale testing of a stadium for jumping crowd load, which is not something you see every day. Um, before I move on, I would like to share some info uh, on EAPSE with you. Um, EAPSE's mission is uh, to exchange knowledge and advance the practice of structural engineering worldwide. Uh, and uh, we're talking every aspect of structural engineering. We have over 2,500 members in 100 countries. Um, EAPSA does uh, publications. We have our journal called Structural Engineering International um, and bulletins uh, with the uh, case studies and conference proceedings and guidelines. Um, within EAPSA, there are both uh, national groups and task groups. The national groups uh, have uh, different events uh, every year. In uh, the Danish uh, national group, for instance, we just last year had a site visit to the new uh, Storstrom bridge that is uh, being built at the moment. And in other countries, they have other different events. Um, in the task groups uh, that goes across borders, you can join other engineers for uh, discussions and uh, development within different technical topics. On the events, we have this year, we have the symposium in Prague this spring. Uh, it's on uh, challenges for uh, existing and oncoming structures. Uh, I think that will be very interesting. And uh, later in September, uh, uh, we have the Congress in Nanjing uh, on bridges and structures. And finally, please note that uh, YAPSA has a Young Engineers program and student, a possibility of student memberships. Uh, and it has a lot of benefits. Uh, not only is it cheaper, uh, you also get free access to, uh, to our journal uh, for the last uh, 30 years and uh, lots of other good stuff. So with that uh, introduction, I think I will uh, hand over the word to uh, our speakers of today, Torben and Klaus. Uh, yeah, welcome. I hope you will introduce yourselves. So, um, excellent. Thank you. Thank you for joining. My name is Tom Bangsgaard. I'm a chief consultant with Ramble Denmark, working with uh, structural monitoring and dynamic loading. With me today, we also have Klaus. Yes, uh, we'll be using the same presentation. Yeah, my name is uh, Klaus Pedersen. Uh, I have been working with the existing uh, structures for 25 years, uh, mainly bridges, but uh, oh, also the, 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 this one for the last uh, two, two years, two years, which, which, which actually, actually turned out to be quite interesting. So, yeah. Yes. So, the topic of today is uh, full scale load testing of a stadium for jumping crowd load or say rehabilitation of a uh, standing grandstand or standing terrace on Brøndby Stadium in Copenhagen. It's the second largest stadium in Denmark and in, in Copenhagen and uh, by all means it's probably the most famous grandstand in, in, in Denmark uh, due to the atmosphere there. Um, 
as Klaus said, it's a project that's been going on for quite some years. It's a very unique project with a unique solution and new problem to it. Um, and we will, through this presentation, go through uh, the entirety of the project, so to speak, a tell it all uh, presentation. Uh, of course, we would focus on the uh, particular interesting details and how those were resolved. Um, now, let's see if this one rolls. This should be a video. There will be video throughout the presentation. And if they are going to be a bit, uh, say, say, rough it in on your end i apologize for that uh, but 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 now stadiums and other structures obviously has to sustain the load that is on them and for many years it's been known that when people move that is a larger load than when people stand still the only known example is that when you tested a bridge in the middle ages you had a company of soldiers marching over the bridge and if you didn't want it to cause a significant larger load then they have to stop marching and just mark randomly so correlated loading is something you knew that back in the days when uh, let's see if we can see that again um, when the inaugurated Wembley stadium in 1923 they tested it with loading it with, with 1200 soldiers that were asked to stand and march still and obviously that was larger load than when people were we're just standing still. Now, that is not the same as jumping, but increase the load. And um, let's see how Christ. Now, YouTube is good. Like, excellent. Um, if we fast forward to the 80s, then we started to see that people were jumping also because the stadiums were starting to be used for concerts. A very particular example in, 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 in uh, Scandinavia is the Ullevi Stadium in Gothenburg, where Bruce Springsteen in 1985 made the entire stadium shake by, by people jumping and dancing to, to one of his songs. I cannot recall what song it was and what kind of rhythm it was, but essentially it, it compromised the safety of the structure for a large part of the stadium. That had to be uh, came kind of cleared for for further damages and further safety issues afterwards. Um, that introduced that people will increase the load when jumping, and and that is a, a a particular problem for places where people congregate and act in correlation. Now, in the 90s in Denmark, very different approaches were taken, or say, at the end of the day, very different results came out of some of the new stadiums that we constructed in the 90s in Denmark. At that time, we had our design code in Denmark had not been updated with any load model for dynamic crowd loading or dynamic jumping load, dynamic loading from jumping people or for pedestrian loading. Uh, so when Grandview Stadium and the grandstand we're talking about today, which is over here in the end, and then there's an identical one down here in the bottom, that's the two oldest parts of the stadium. When that was constructed in 1992, you just used standard elements and you didn't account for dynamic loading from the jumping spectators. At the very same time, Parking Stadium, the National Stadium of Denmark that was used for the European uh, Championships last year, was constructed. And, and I cannot say why it is, but it ended up being that that structure is much more robust. You have elements that are resting upon each other in the kind of the staircase profile rather than independent elements that you ended up with on Bungie Stadium. And that means that you actually are able to sustain a much larger dynamic loading and you're able to dampen out by friction damping between the elements if you are going to see some, some, some loading take place. And at, at just a few, few, a few years later, and before we had a dynamic load uh, design code in, in Denmark, one of the Olbo Stadium down here in the corner was expanded. And at that time, we kind of realized that probably jumping means something to the total loading of the grandstand. So they conducted a number of experiments with the local university at the same time Klaus was studying there. And uh, they realized that you would actually get a dynamic amplification of at least six by jumping on the stadium, uh, the, the, the terrace elements, uh, rather than, than just standing on them. So factor of six on, on the load from all the people standing there, that's quite massive. So they started to realize that. In 1999, in the Danish Old Danish Standard 410, it was updated with a dynamic load model. It came out of the German ISO standard um, and it included three load harmonics. We're not going to move into detail with that, but just mention that it had three load harmonics and uh, apologize for that. Um, and it had constant modal amplitude and it had constant what's called mo mo magnitude reduction factors that accounts for the correlation of the loading between the number of active people. So those two coefficients were constant irrespective of what frequency the people were jumping with. It was required that people should be able to jump between one hertz, which is very slow, and three hertz, which is extremely fast actually for humans to jump at three hertz. Kind of the natural is somewhere between two, around two hertz, and that's also what we're going to see on, on Bonby Stadium. 
Um, it also assumed that people were able to jump fully correlated at jumping frequency. And that's something we're also going to see. It's probably not true. But nevertheless, having a load model improved the benefits uh, and, 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 and actually improved the design of the structures. Now, that at the same time, or just a few years after that, there started to get tendency of, 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 of people to jump on stadiums. It, it started in, 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 we have heard various stories from our collaborating partners. It started in, in either in, in, in Germany, some say, some say in Hamburg, uh, sorry, in Frankfurt, and some say it started in Argentina. And if you can also find videos where you have um, those Frankfurt supporters jumping at Bunby Stadium in 2007 for a visiting match, but also at their own stadium in 2015. And Boca Juniors has made a, a um, earthquake video uh, around the, the kind of the net culture of jumping. And probably wanted to do the same. So we helped them with a promotional earthquake video in 2016. And you can see that it shakes quite a lot. I, I hope you were able to see that from the video. Now that kind of shows that jumping load was something that was introduced in, in, in the zeros of uh, the zeros and zeros. That was something that's a culture that grew. And luckily we have a design code that handles it, it but for all old structures, it can be an issue. In 2018, Ramblin was commissioned by Bunbury EF, the owner, club, and operator of the stadium, to conduct a number of, of measurements, dynamic measurements of what's called Susan. Uh, it's the South Side Standing Terrace. Uh, that's the old structure that was built in 1992. It consists of 14 meter long elements, so they are very long. They are prefabricated, pre-stressed, and they are quite slender. So they have a natural frequency of just 5.4 hertz, approximately. And in total, there were six bands and seven rows. So that's around 100 long beams that all acted independently when people were just standing it on jumping. And approximately 40 people could stand on, on one of each element. So it's only 40 people that has to agree to jump intensively, then that element would shake quite aggressively. So we were, we were asked to, to conduct some dynamic measurements. Over the years, over the 25 years of use, um, it was clear that the, the structure had taken some damage. Probably can't be said that it's from the jumping, but at least you had severe cracking. It's in the primary beam supporting the, the terrace elements. You have the terrace elements up here, and then you have the, the crocodile beams or staircase beams uh, with a lot of cracks. That's a mightily enforced, uh, reinforced structure. Now, we conducted some, 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 some uh, say very uh, focused monitoring with actual parameters for the vibrations of the terrace elements. And we also looked at the, at the cracks of the primary, uh, primary beams. Um, and out of that came that we measured the acceleration of 1.9 G. That's not the same as you saw in the previous video from Brandy Stadium. At that time, we actually only measured 1 G and that was still enough to make an earthquake video out of it. But 1.90, e, that's quite severe. It was a jumping frequency of around 1.9 hertz. And again, we have, we have this natural frequency of 5.4 hertz. So you have a pretty good um, uh, coincidence between the loading frequency and the third load harmonic. Uh, so the third load harmonic of the load uh, coincided, coincided with, uh, with the natural frequency and, and, and made a rather large response. It can still be seen if you do an analysis of it that it's a forced response. It's it's not it's not resonance. It's dominated by the response of the and by the uh, by the load harmonic at 1.9 hertz. So we were able to to uh, derive that we had a deflection going up of 45 millimeters and a deflection going down of 45 millimeters. Slightly um, say asymmetric, but nevertheless 45 millimeters two times a second going down. That's quite severe, and that's what we are able to see in the video. That meant that you had a ULS uh, utilization of the moment capacity of the terrace elements of 135%. So obviously the safety was compromised. It happened to be that the characteristic load, uh, characteristic uh, uh, utilization was only 84%. So say there was a good reason why it had not fallen down. Um, and that was with 40 people standing at it. And then we said, okay, every person probably weighs around 80 kilo because football supporters and average are probably slightly heavier than the average of, 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 uh, of the society. That was the same as a dynamic amplification of 6.3. So if you go back, then the, 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 the findings of, of Alpha Stadium and back in the 90s were actually quite good. We had a, we had a six, factor six there, and that's compared to a static deflection of people who are just standing still of seven millimeters. Now the original design was something completely different. They had just accounted for a light load of four kilonewtons per square meter. 
they had no dynamic case. And actually, the, you can argue the reason why it had not fallen down, the reason why we only have 84% characteristic utilization is because they had added a lot of extra strings, pre-stressed strings to the, uh, to the service elements due to the deflection criteria that essentially increased the efficient uh, dynamic amplification ca capacity of, of, of the elements to 4.4. If you did not have this deflection criteria, L over 400, well, uh, it's, it's difficult to say, but, but, but uh, it's fair to, to, to think that, that the, the, the structure would have uh, not been able to sustain the load. So the deflection criteria actually is effective for something else than just making things not look like they're hanging on the middle. Now, when we uh, came out with this information, we had to inform the club that they had to do something about it, and that immediately hit the news. And when bad things happen in football, it comes on the front page. And, um, and, and, and that was obviously something the club was not very, very, very fond about. But on the other hand, they acted extremely responsible. They knew that safety of their, their, their supporters were, were paramount. So they immediately instituted uh, restrictions back in the end of, of, of 2018. They reduced the, um, the, the, the capacity from 740, 700 people to 2,700 people. They installed chairs that the people were dispersed and kind of like, like the concentration and the congregation of people were less, less severe. And we also closed all the central sections of the, of the grandstand where, where uh, people had been jumping the most for many years in order to, to, to kind of uh, at least uh, take a, a break on that part before we, until we could see if, if, if other solutions should be, um, should be pursued. So, um, so restrictions were, were something that was already there in, in 18. Um, now, we then investigated various strengthening solutions with the club, and, and uh, it was very difficult to fulfill the requirements of the new code with the dynamic load model that we saw in the previous slide. We would have to at least increase the natural frequency from 5.4 hertz to 8 hertz, and that would be... Um, had to be done for all TT elements. And we had a hundred of those. So strengthening solutions were expensive, like a global strengthening solution. We could also replace the structure and replace all the elements, but in total, it would mean that, that, that the strengthening would at least at that time estimated to be 10 to 15 million. Actually, we ended up estimating it a bit higher at the end of it. And, and the new structure, if we should replace it, was 15 to 20 million. And that was something that, that um, that we, we, we found were quite severe. So at the same time as that, we started to look into rehabilitation and strengthening based on measurements. What could we do to the grandstands and to the terrace elements such that we didn't have to strengthen every single element and increase the natural frequency to eight hertz in order to reduce the, the, the vibrations uh, for every potential vibration for every element. But what could we do based on the nature that we actually had the structure available, we were able to measure on the structure, monitor the structure response, and actually understand the nature of that. And by that kind of find a guided strengthening solution that kind of remediated the problem and, and removed the issue that was particular for this case without, yes, at the end of the day, without fulfilling every part of the dynamic um, pedestrian loading uh, from the design code. Um, the focus was on removing these restrictions. We wanted to get the capacity up to 4700. We wanted to remove the seats and we wanted to remove the closed zones. Um, and what could we do with that? Well, in order to do that, we, uh, we needed to monitor, as I said. We had a suspicion that it was not all the elements that in practice had identical large or programmatic response. It seemed like that some elements had a larger a response than other, but we were very difficult to identify what was the cause of that. So essentially the thinking was that we needed to understand the nature of the response in a larger respect and understand if we could find a way to kind of remove these outliers that had the largest response. So at first we needed to do some cost-effective monitoring because we had a hundred elements uh, that needs to be monitored in some way or the other. So at first we started using uh, smartphone monitoring. Ramble has their own app that is uh, really available. It can be used to both short-term and long-term monitoring. And we were able to do remote login and remote uh, uh, access to the phone and, and, and also remote upload directly to, to the cloud so that it was quite efficient. Now it still required, we needed quite a lot of phones to do that. So we were thinking in other directions for, for capturing all the states that we need in order to understand the structure. 
what we then did was that we installed GoPro cameras behind the, 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 the terrace elements, and then we installed markers, and we used DIC, which is uh, by now quite familiar, a massive digital image correlation, where we captured and, 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 and the, the movement of the structure, which is clearly visible, as you can see from the video, just by the camera registering in the chains of the markers in the frame of the, of, the, of the video. And then we could get a time series out of that based on the uh, sampling frequency of the video. That was extremely efficient because it meant that we would one with one DIC camera with one GoPro camera, and we were actually able to use GoPro cameras directly from, from, from Best Buy or any other uh, hardware supplier that you consume a hardware supplier. We were able to, to capture the response of quite a lot of, of, of um, of uh, terrorist elements in one go. So that was uh, definitely an efficient way to capture the data. And we got quite good quality out of that, got a good understanding of the structure. It meant that we um, were able to see the variation of the response between the different elements and the synchronization of those if there were differences in magnitude or in phase of the responses. And we were able to capture data extremely efficiently. Unfortunately, Corona came in March uh, 2020, and at that time, we only had monitored for six games, but it still gave us a lot of information to build upon. And but after that, then, then the football was continued without supporters, obviously. Um, the issue with the design code was that we uh, had to assume that the loading takes place up to three hertz, that people are able to jump up to three hertz, and as said, it's assuming that people jump equally high and equally well correlated at high frequencies. And that doesn't seem to be the case. People in football and with football songs, like supporter songs, are jumping something between 1.7 and 2 hertz. So that's down here. And here we have our horizontal line is the capacity of, of the service elements, 4.4 dynamic amplification uh, of, the, of the static loading. And we can see that we were able to actually handle the issue quite up till around. Um, 2.2, 2.3 hertz, but we needed to do something about the higher frequencies. And that's where our understanding of the nature of the loading were uh, paramount to, to, to be able to say, what can we do here? And as said, what can we do about uh, saying that the load is not fully correlated and that they're not able to jump at, 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 at full height or full intensity at, at high frequencies. If we could do something and remove this here, then we would be able to strengthen the structure just to 4.4 and then remove the outliers. So what we essentially focused on was to remove the outliers by tying the structure together. As I said, the elements are independent. So we tied it together with a cross bracing that meant that, that if one element is going down, all the elements have to go down together or if they're going to be held up by each other. It's kind of a, a, kind of a flexible support at the middle of the elements. And that meant that people would also have to be more well correlated jumping in larger groups because inst instead of only 40 people on one element, it would have to be say in the order of 300 people on eight or 10 elements before you would see a lot large, vibration, uh, large vibrations. And that seemed to be a suitable solution. And yes. I think you should be able to, to hear him here, 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 me now. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think that was the more or less the overall basis for what we, how were we actually going to the uh, machine, the new uh, steel then. So, um, could could you move forward, Tom? Yeah. So what? Uh, yeah. Our our overall basis is then that uh, based on these uh, six games, uh, we saw that in the in the spans where we do, do not have any uh, mm, mm, stiffness, we saw that we would have uh, the mm, 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 friction in the order of up to twenty one mil, while in the case where we actually do have the mm, mm, stiffness. We saw something like maybe up to up to 16, and the, these numbers they were all based on that we were that there was something like uh, 28 persons per element, and that we had all uh, chairs uh, in the uh, place. 
meaning that we uh, would uh, we, we were able to see uh, a DAF of in the order of something like maybe may, may four over here, while the one that we actually measured down in uh, or back in in 2018 was something like six six point three actually. And in the case where we actually had this uh, stiffener, we saw uh, something up to maybe two and a half on, or maybe three, but uh, it seems to be something like that. So our our uh, our air, mm, assumption based on these uh, six games certainly uh, seems that it will have uh, it, it will have some, some effect. Um, and uh, I will not go into too 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 many numbers, but I think these numbers we probably probably have to look into. Uh, Tom also told that it was it, it uh, 4.4 was based on the capacity. So the if we if we calculate the bending moment capacity of the TT TT elements, then we will end up with it, the mm, sign value of 493. And uh, then the 4.4 is simply calculated by that we will have uh, the sign load that it will be given, 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 given by this. A factor of 1.1 is due to the consequent class. We will have the dead load. We will have the safety factor for the live load. We have uh, calculated that um, 40 people will give a bending moment of something like 50, 50, 50, 50 meaning that we will end up with um, this one, uh, which will correspond to uh, that we actually can uh, accept uh, the uh, um, flexion in the order of 31 millimeter, since we have a um, static deflection of something like seven. And then if we remove the safety, then we will end up with something uh, like the numbers down here, the capacity will increase. And then of course, we will then be able to increase in, increase the depth. And uh, someone might might uh, think it's a bit odd that 8.8 .8 seems to be uh, exactly two times 4.4. And it, it, it actually is a coincidence. So, but meaning that the, at 62 millimeters, uh, we, we will have more or less no safety left, except that uh, there will be, still be something due to the, that the uh, uh, strings will of course be, uh, will, will be some kind of a, 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 a fractile. Uh, but I mean, around maybe 65, 77, 7, 70 millimeter, we will probably, uh, we will probably have failure. Um, yeah, so what, what we then were look, looking into was this uh, was actually five different types of reinforcement here, you can only only see four of them. We were, we were, we were going to add some uh, transverse uh, stiffness and the green ones are the one that is more or less the same as, as you saw on the pick, 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 pick here before. Uh, we will have uh, someone that will be uh, that, will, that will be more or less the same uh, the, the the same function, but they will be located underneath the uh, and the and I will come back to the reason for that. Then we will have to reinforce the, the main uh, girders that will be shown in red. Uh, we were only able to uh, only able to uh, only able to access the upper ones, so we 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 came up with a solution for the lower one, with some kind of ex, extra extra um, support. Uh, and the next one here, here you can see the six times uh, 14 meters. You can see that the green ones are the one that where we have the transverse beams that will be located above the the deck. We will have the blue blue and white one that are located here. There will be some six of them. The reason for that is that in order to to uh, not to in 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 to, 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 um, fear with the e e uh, um, 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 escape uh, um, routes, it would be it, it would be at an, at at um, to, 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 to have them um, underneath the deck, 
I think that, that they would have lost something in the order of 250 receipts if they were going to be on the on the on the the, the other side. Uh, then there were these uh, strengthening of, of of the main girders that can be seen here in red, um, and then uh, we also had were going to add four uh, four uh, meter beams, which only were going to be in the in the center part. Uh, and then next one, Tom, yeah. But uh, since uh, we were going to make a design that were not, uh, we, we were not able to find the load in, in, in code, then we'll have to come up with the loading more or less on our own. So what we then did was that we, of course, made some kind of an uh, FE model. And then we were going to in, uh, install the new members in the model, and then we will see if we if we sub rejected it to some some kind of loading. What would what would then happen? And and what you see here is that we have the seven seventeen rows. And uh, in at the uh, diagram uh, down here, you can see uh, any moment. Over here, you can see you can see the deflection for each row, and the top curve here is where we will add the 40 people on each row, meaning that uh, there will of course be more or less no um, forces in these uh, uh, transverse uh, in, in, in stiffness, and you will have the overall the um, flexion of all um, decks will be in the order of these um, 7.1 mil. The reason that you can see a very very slight uh, curve here is that there will also be a small a small deflection of the of 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 the main girder. And then the four curves you can see, see here is a curve where you will have uh, lo located people only on, for instance, the first, uh, the first, the first uh, five elements. So that in, then, then you'll see some something like this, something like this, uh, and you can see this curve here, for instance, will be will will be in, in the case where we'll have loads from uh, element uh, six to um, ten. And what you see down here is that if you only have load on a single on a single row on a single element, that means that the, the reflection for that one will then uh, drop to something like uh, two mil. Uh, so it, meaning that it will be it, it, the something like that will that be uh, seventy percent of 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 the load will then go uh, somewhere else. And if you go to the next one. Then uh, we have tried to compare compare the the um, effect of these uh, two um, 14 meter 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 beams that were going to be in um, installed on row 10 and row 14. So if you compare this this curve over here with the curve on the right, you can see that 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 there certainly is an um, influence of of of. of of them, and, and you can also see that the um, effect for row 10 and row um, 14 seems to spread to, yeah, uh, from maybe row 7, 8 up to uh, 6, 16, or 17. And then it, uh, I'll go quickly to what we, how it, 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 it act, actually looks out there. Uh, the next one, the first one is these uh, upper transverse beams that are, well, simply some kind of a parapet. Uh, uh, it has been, uh, in order to sustain the force, will actually be able to act both uh, upwards and downwards. It has been uh, fixed by some by, by, by these uh, rods so that we will either transfer the force down to the, the element uh, well, well out here because the, the actual the actual uh, slab is, is actually quite thin so it, it will not be able to with a uh, stand stand the uh, loading. Uh, the others are the one that will be uh, installed on the, underneath the TC elements, 
uh, more or less the same the, the same principle, except that in this case we will then we will then have to have some kind of an up up a um, plate that will uh, distribute the forces that will go up to these uh, to these rods, and then it, it it will go out to the the what what we call it the webs of the TC beams. Then we were going to make some reinforcement of the main uh, regulators. Quite simple, where we were going to add some kind of a steel plate, steel plate below. The steel plate will act as some kind of extra reinforcement in order to make them act to together. We are going to make the surface rough. Uh, and, uh, and there would be, be then uh, will drill in some anchors, and then also these uh, these these uh, bars here, they actually serve partly as uh, reinforcement, but also they will they are uh, post retention. Uh, Meaning that there will then be uh, friction be between the the old um, concrete and 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 the, the, the new steel plate. Um, then there was this uh, kind of odd sub support um, below the the lower main girders, and the, this uh, sub support is actually. Uh, not active for normal normal loading. It's only some kind of uh, should we call it extra extra safety measures, meaning that if the loading on these uh, beams would be really really large, then you would actually have an ex 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 extra extra support here. And finally, the uh, 14 meter beams, they do have a quite odd uh, geometry. Uh, the reason, well, of course, what we would like to, uh, to, to have is that we would like to have uh, some extra stiffness. Stiffness means that it should uh, be uh, it, it, it should be some kind kind of uh, of uh, high beam, but due to uh, some kind of uh, assisting uh, wind bracing. We were we 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 we, we uh, more stricter than that, and it, it's also also the reason for having this uh, quite a low part over here, and we have a uh, uh, deep 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 deeper part here, and you can then see that uh, we will also need this whole hole at, at 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 the center in order to have these. Uh, uh, these uh, uh, transverse beams uh, being able, 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 able to pass. But I mean, all in all, we, I think we, the total weight of the of of these beams, there were, was it uh, two and a half to three tons per beam, and the total weight of all the, the steel that we have installed is in is uh, less than uh, thirty tons. And uh, then I think we'll go back to talk. So, one sec, like that. So, uh, with uh, that's a bit of, yeah, so excellent. Okay, so with, with the strengthen in place and a strengthen that's focused on tying the elements together, strengthening the primary girder such that they are also able to be sustain, sustain the same loading, this dynamic application of 4.4. Of the 40 people jumping, um, and and also the additional longitudinal 14 meter long beams and placed in the central spans in order to support the place where people are jumping the most and have been jumping the most historic line and so it's been kind of, uh, been, been been wearing out the uh, fatigue capacity of those uh, terrace elements potentially. With that in place, then we needed to look into how to recommission the stadium in order to reach back and then get this 4700 people in place. Because the 4.4 uh, dynamic application was not a full meeting of the design code. As, as I said, we accepted that. Um, we had made an argument about not meeting the design requirements for high frequency jumping. So as, as Klaus mentioned, we had a ULS design criteria of 31 millimeters, that's 4.4 dynamic amplification, that's relative to the static displacement of seven millimeters. And we needed to demonstrate that the structure and the response that we're going to see would be nowhere near that level. So we instituted acceptance criteria of at least 
at, at, of at most 90% of that criteria hint, we would accept at most 28 millimeters deflection. And then we also accepted that we cannot just go from the construct, like, like if you typically construct a structure and you, you do it uh, in, with regards to the design code, obviously you just take it into use. You might do a test case or it, you do that test case with full loading or, and you understand it and then you take it into use with full capacity. But since we have not done that, we wanted to step it up phase-wise to increase the load in, in steps and validate that the response we saw was the response we expected and that we had room to take the next step in terms of the loading. So we defined four steps. We wanted to have a validation 100% see, see that the strengthening that we had uh, put in, in, in installed that that actually worked at as, as, as expected for the unchanged load compared to the six games we had before the strengthening project. Then we wanted to remove 50% of the seats and see that we did not increase the response that much, have a temporary situation there. And then again, we wanted to reduce, remove the last 50% seats so there would be no seats on the stadium and then to uh, conduct in-game measurements there and, and, and validate that the uh, responses we saw were, were in place. And then again, because we had not, we had challenged the code, we had uh, bended it a bit. We also accepted with the club owner that permanent monitoring would be in place such that you for some of the largest matches and we would measure it and validate that the response would still stay within safe limits. So that would be stage four. Now, unfortunately, during the period uh, where we were still not able to put about 700 people on the grandstand, and that is where the most dedicated grungy sports are standing and jumping for every match. Unfortunately, in the spring of 2021, so half a year ago, Brunby was in the race for their first championship in 15 seasons. And Brunby regarding itself as, as, as one of the largest club, the largest club, but being caught up by, by, by FC Copenhagen in the meantime of those 15 years, that was unfortunate because no people were standing on the grandstand at that point due to Corona. So for the very last match, the gold match, they were able to put 900 people in, in, into the grandstand and we monitored that and, 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 and um, as, as point we won the championship. And we can see that the response we got from those 900 people were just four millimeters dynamic. To that, you should obviously add up the static deflection, but nevertheless, that's much less obviously because there are much fewer people. But we could also see that it was not during the match, it was actually after the match as they were celebrating and singing the fan songs. Again, it means that it's always about the correlated loading. That's where it took place. It was a, it was a good day to the club and, 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 and nice to take part of. Um, we needed to validate it. And because of Corona, we started discussing with the club if we could replace in-game monitoring where we monitor it with seats on and reduce capacity for a number of games, if we could replace that with full-scale load testing or load test experiments where we actually controlled how many people would be on the grandstand and which frequency they would be jumping to. By that, we could move people around and we could actually test various configurations and follow some of the curves from the FE model that Klaus was also presenting before. Now, that is a very good way to validate um, the reinforcement and the rehabilitation project and test the load capacity and dynamic load nature of the, uh, of the jumping crowd load. Uh, but it's also costly because in order to move people around and plan everything, it, 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 it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of time. We didn't expect to replace everything. We still planned with the club that we would monitor after the full capacity of 4,700 people were in place monitor a number of matches in order to validate the full capacity response. But we wanted to replace the limited capacity response with the load testing because now we wanted people back on the grandstand. Now that is um, uh, because we had the cross bracing, so the, 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 the uh, transverse stiffness between the uh, terrace element, the TT elements, we needed a lot of people there because no longer we could, we needed around 300 people in order to excite eight rows and even more if we wanted to excite 10 or 17 rows. So uh, it was a load experiment with at least 300 people, preferably more, and then we would move people around from different, from different spans and zones and different ventilation, and ask them to do different things. And we installed uh, various accelerometers of various kinds and DIC GoPro cameras in order to, to capture the response. Yeah, we have a surveillance image of the group jumping uh, or actually standing and we can see they're loading eight to 10 rows 
with around 40 people per row. And then we accepted that there were no people uh, on the front rows because the influence between the front rows and the, the, uh, the back rows is rather limited. That kind of has a, has a width influence length of around two to three elements. And then we controlled what they were doing. We we're able to both capture the dynamic deflection and the static deflection with DIC. Um, with the DIC, we could simply see as people move on the staircase or move off the staircase, we could capture the static deflections of the difference between the settlement here. Now, if you handle 350 people, preparation is king, because in order to tell football supporters what to do, when to do it, and, and, and also move them around from the different configuration, that takes time. So we did 20 load tests of 20 seconds where they were jumping to a certain frequency, oh, and that took around two hours. And at that time, people were completely dead. They, uh, on the other hand, they had not been jumping practicing for one and a half years due to corona. So maybe that's also why their legs were a bit sore. Um, we focused on also making an authentic atmosphere because it seems that this jumping culture is what's been driving the load stop over the last years across the stadiums in, in Europe and the world. So the fans were jumping to their own fan drums and fan songs, and then we supported it with loudspeakers when we had to jump at high frequencies and use a metronome. Now, here's a video and um, if there's no, yeah, we don't have noise on, uh, sound on, but, but, but they are definitely singing. Um, and they were jumping and we can easily see that they are completely uncorrelated. If that's also due to one and a half year of lacking practice, possibly that's, that's also a causing factor, but people are not jumping correlated. And that is one of the assumptions of the Eurocode uh, low portal and something just from the images we could, uh, we could at least point out is not true. And then we can start digging into how, how much is it not true. Um, we were able to vary the load uh, intensity, that's the number of people per row, and see that um, there was a pretty much one-to-one -one scaling between the number of people on each row and, 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 and the response. And we got a dynamic response of only 12 millimeters um, in the most heavily loaded rows, uh, where we did not have these 14 meter long beams. We had less where we had that. That adding the static, uh, the static, um, Adding the static deflections, that meant that we had around 17 millimeters of um, of um, of total deflection, or just 60 percent of the acceptance criteria. And where we had the 14 meter long beams in central elements, we had less. Now that was a mix of supporters, and not the 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 all, all of them were not the, the very dedicated ones. So when we started, when we come back and have a match. We, we expected to see that the nine elements, nine millimeters total uh, response we measured on the, in the central fans where we had the 40 meter long beams, that would probably be increased because now in the matches, we would have most dedicated supporters that jumps more intensively and are also more trained to do it. We were also able to test frequency variation. Now that was the key part of the challenging and the kind of the conservative assumption of the Euro code that people were able to jump at full height and fully correlated also at high frequencies. That's something we would not have been able to test if we had stayed with in-game uh, in measurements only, but we're able to have people jump at various frequencies from 1.7 Hertz and up to 1.2.7 Hertz. At that point, people just didn't jump faster. So, um, and we were able to see that we had a completely flat response curve and not a rapidly increasing curve as we can see here over here to the bottom left, uh, bottom right, sorry. Uh, that we were able to just have a flat curve and not have an increasing response or increasing jumping frequency. In the other hand, that's uh, people, the lack of correlation, the breakdown of correlation for high frequencies, and also the breakdown of load and of jumping amplitude for high frequencies means that this model is, 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 is somewhat conservative, highly conservative, conservative. Yes. We were also just based on the PSD able to see the breakdown of correlations because where we had uh, jumping at only 2.1 hertz, we had very narrow peaks. But when we started to see um, multiple peaks and very broad peaks at, um, at uh, higher frequencies. Now, as we were, as we were preparing the, the, the paperwork for the recommissioning, the season took on and we decided to monitor with seats on for the first games of the season. 
uh, in order to validate that what we had seen in the jumping, the full scale jumping experiment was also something we would see in the end game uh, situation. So here we have people back on the on, on, on the grandstand. It's, it's it's summer of 2021. Corona is almost not there in Denmark anymore. We are still only have 100 seats and 25 uh, 2,700 people. But nevertheless, it's a good site. It's something that people have been longing for. Then, because of the very 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 linear one to one proportionality of the response that we have observed in the uh, in the jumping experiments, we were able to just extrapolate. The, uh, the results we captured uh, in game where we only had around 25, 28 people on every row and extrapolate to a case where we had 40 to 44 people, 40 to 42 people and see, okay, what would be the dynamic amplification? So what would be the dynamic response? And so that we could have the static response. And that it followed um, very well. By that, we were able to demonstrate that uh, in game, we would see in the order of 21 millimeter uh, total deflection um, uh, of the terrace elements. And that would be in the central spans, not in the upper central spans where we have the longitudinal beam. Those results would be smaller due to longitudinal beams. But in the front part of the central spans, where also the second most, say, dedicated or active supporters would be standing, that is where we reduce uh, the largest response. So 21 millimeters was still just 75% of the acceptance criteria and 66% of the, of the capacity in ULS. So pretty good. We were in range, range and combined with the demonstration that people did not have, uh, we did not have an increased response at high frequency jumping. That meant that we were in good, good hands and, and, and good shape to, to um, recommission the, uh, the grandstand with 4,700 people, no seats. And finally, in uh, October, 24th of October, 2021, we were finally able to recommission this grandstand with 4,700 people, 0% seats. And it happened in a, what we call a derby or a new firm in Denmark in order to, to kind of recapitulate the uh, old firm of Scotland um, between Brunby and FC Copenhagen, the largest match in Denmark. That was also the match that sort of closed the grandstand three years earlier in November 2018. So it took just over 1,000 days from closure or restrictions till we could finally recommission. And, and lot of behold, when we won, we won. I don't know if that's because there was support from the south side, but it was a good day at least to one We measured 22 millimeters in the central span. So that was just one millimeter larger. Um, it's difficult to see if we say if we're going to see slightly larger numbers as we progress and, and continue to monitor matches with 4,700 people on because it was not much larger compared to the cases where we had seats on. Um, but, but at least it was in range and something we were very, very satisfied with. The additional uh, response compared to the load testing where we controlled the fans, we had expected that because as I said in the load testing, we did not have the most dedicated fans entirely. We had a congregation or kind of a, a, a multitude of different Brunby fans, some more used to jumping than other. And practicing, we must uh, recognize, is, is highly, um, is, 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 is very important to, to, to the jumping mode. Now, as I said, we will continue the validation and um, we'll do that with a permanent monitoring system that the club has installed uh, simply just using Bambi phones that are remote accessible and there's automatic cloud upload and analysis. So it's a very cost efficient system. And by that, they can do proactive maintenance and continuously demonstrate that the uh, vibrations and the deflection stay within range and that the grandstand is safe. Now, epilogue, because that was a successful case, that was due to the value of professional maintenance. Point to the club the owner, the user, they had been proactive quite from the start. They had tried to follow up on, on maintaining their, 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 their asset, their grandstand, using some of the experts in, in, in structural engineering in Denmark. As we addressed the problem of, of, of too large response and insufficient capacity, they immediately instituted restrictions. 
and then they supported the folks who are doing to remediate the problem and rehabilitate the, uh, the grant fund. So it shows that you really can do something by being a good owner and a responsible owner to, to your structure. We are happy for example, that we came up with a sustainable solution where we're able to strengthen the existing structure rather than replace it with new concrete structures. And that we were able to do that by uh, supporting the knowledge with the structural monitoring of the existing structure. And it was also a cost-effective solution. We saved in the order of 65 to 70% of the cost of a new stand, of new grant stand, um, uh, or in other hand, in other words, uh, the club saved uh, something between 12 and 14 million DKK. Now, good asset management doesn't sell newspapers because when we closed the stadium, when we closed the grandstand, there was multiple front page news and all Danish newspapers. But when we reopened it, there was only one article and that was in the Danish technical newspaper, The Indian Year. We think it was pretty good, but it's kind of weird that they didn't pick up. So yeah, you can say that it's kind of unsexy to do good asset management. To confirm that, uh, let's see, just, just one week, the 17th, the, sorry, the 15th of October in the Netherlands, you had a structural failure of a terrace element in, uh, in the city of Nijmegen. You can see the rapid buildup that comes extremely fast as people start jumping. It's the way team that are jumping, it's their way team that's just won the match and one terrace element breaks. Now, obviously that sold newspapers. It was all over the news in the Netherlands at that time. Everybody uh, was covering it. So it fully really shows the difference between being knowledgeable and responsible and, and being inknowledgeable uh, as is the case here. Sorry. Um, because it's, it's odd coincidence that it took place at the same time, pretty much the same time, the same week. Um, it's lucky that really nobody got hurt in the Netherlands because by a sea accident, you had a steel container standing right, right below that very element. Um, it was just a local failure. The failure has been identified by uh, a uh, local uh, specialized consult the consultant there. And one of the reasons was that you had a design flaw in the, uh, or in the production of the design uh, of the reinforcement layout. But another reason is that the Dutch design code back in the day when the stadium was built 20 years ago did not include dynamic pedestrian loading or jumping crowd loading, and it still doesn't. So there's a significant difference between the national standards across Europe, which is why the Dutch government has instituted that reassessment of design codes in all stadiums are now going to take place. And with that, uh, thank you. And, and um, well, the conclusion really is that maintains a structural safety of stadiums is important and it's the responsibility of, uh, of the people owning or operating the stadium. Thank you. Thank you, Torben and Klaus. Um... Now there's time for some uh, Q&A, if anybody is interesting or want an elaboration of uh, some of the interesting topics that were touched upon. Um, I can start. Uh, I've worked with the clients uh, operating existing structures for many years and uh, so how did they react when you told them that they needed to restrict access to their stand uh, even though it has been, it had been you know active for 20 30 years mm. without any problems yes you know it has been there for 20 30 years why do yeah. we have to do something now yeah, you, you could imagine that they would be saying, well, what's the issue? We have had different consultants before. We've used the stadium for 25 years. It's never been an issue. Um, but they didn't. It, it was clear that, that uh, a football club is uh, focused on, on safety of their, of their supporters. They are used to that, everything from escape use to fire plants and also by now terrorism, terrorism uh, safety. Um, so when we said, okay, you have a structural safety problem, uh, they didn't really understand the structural part, but they took the word safety to their heart immediately and essentially just asked what needs to be done. Um, so that was something different that we actually had expected. We expected a more uh, kind of please go away attitude, um, but it was extremely positive to see and work with and something we have, we have seen with the other clubs we have been uh, working for since. Thanks. 
If there are any other questions, uh, please uh, type them in the Q and A uh, session, and I will uh, try passing them through to Torben and uh, Klaus. Um, can you re just repeat for me what what were the the main diff? You, you you said that if you did like a analysis using the Danish standard mm -hmm. for the loading. Uh, uh, the, capa the capacity wouldn't be sufficient. What were the main differences? Just a quick resume on the main differences you found from the load testing. The, the load testing demonstrated that we uh, the response we we we, we had uh, fell under the dynamic amplification of 4.4. It was lower than lower than that. So you can say that just having a structure with with a, just having a structure with a capacity of of a, equal to a dynamic amplification of 4.4 on the dynamic loading, that that is sufficient. And then it validated that um, that people uh, were not able to jump as intensively, in particular at high frequencies, as is defined in the in the load model. Uh, it, 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 the load model is such that if you have a dynamic, uh, if you have a natural frequency of the structure that is less than eight, nine, ten hertz, then you're going to be punished because you're going to see um, interference between the third load harmonic and the first natural frequency um, because you assume that people are able to jump with high free, high intensity up to three hertz. Three by three is nine, but they're not. So even though that we have interference at with the second load harmonic, we are not able to see that uh, that response at all. And that's because what's driving the load with this particular structure, and it might be different for other structures, is forced vibration. At the end of the day, it's actually not uh, to a large degree uh, resonance that are driving the response. It's the forced vibration of the, of the people jumping, um, which, which meant that we, uh, we were not punished at all. Thanks. There is a question from uh, A.M. William in Uganda asking, um, isn't jump lo loading in stadiums considered during structural design of steel and concrete? Um, yes, like, like I, I assume what, what, what the question is that, that uh, shouldn't you account for it? Um, and, 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 and yes, you should, and yes, we do today. Um, in Denmark, in, in, in UK, in Germany, but uh, but in uh, in the 1990s uh, in Denmark you didn't. For happy accidents, parking stadium is actually managed to do it, and all more stadium thought about it and did academic research. But when they constructed Pondby Stadium uh, in 1992, they didn't. Uh, they did have done that after 1999 um, for on new stadiums in Denmark. But as said, in uh, even today in the Netherlands. You have no uh, load model for dynamic amplification of crowd loads. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it varies. It's good to hear that uh, you have that internationally at least. Um, Jan Huisberg is asking In your two hour experiment, you show the unloaded measurement at the end. Are there fluctuations in the unloaded part? Are the fluctuations in the unloaded part your sensitivity? And if so, are you satisfied with that accuracy? Thank you for a very good presentation. Um, yes, it is part of the sensitivity. It's part of the optical sensitivity, or say the, the visual sensitivity of the of the pixels in the camera, etc. Um, you could process it more carefully and, and do a digital filter, a digital processing to to kind of remove part of that uh, fluctuation and, 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 and kind of reconstruct part of the accuracy, uh, provided you know something about how uh, how the, the data is captured. And you could do that by test data afterwards. We decided not to do that, as we were quite happy with the, uh, with the information available. For the, purpose, for the purpose of the owner and the client, which essentially at the end of the day want to have a safe stadium that they can use for uh, full capacity of supporters. We had the sufficient information available to the, uh, the conclusions and the work. This one might be for you, uh, Klaus. Uh, Manfred Hurt is uh, asking, how did you repair the cracked concrete beam? Uh, yeah, Klaus, Klaus unfortunately uh, had to, um, but 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 I can I can um, 
had to step out, but but I can uh, yeah. I can uh, we we are drawing a bit late, but I can stay as long as possible um, as as needed. Sorry, um, we repaired the crack beams by by injection, and then we uh, we 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 we, uh, we installed the additional um, reinforcement plate uh, on the lower side of the of the cracked uh, primary beam. Then we tied it in together with with the threaded rods above the um, above the uh, the horizontal plateaus of the crocodile beams in order to tie it in and kind of pre-stress the uh, the cross section in order to to act as here reinforcement. I don't know if that's the uh... thanks. So it, it it kind of became a composite uh, a composite beam so to speak between a steel plate and a concrete beam. Uh, Manfred is also asking if there will be an EAPS publication of your study. Uh, that's still uh, unsettled. Maybe, maybe that would be that would be very fun. Yes, um, I'll let you know if if, uh, if 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 it's going to take place. Um, I have actually one more question. Uh, how did you find the approval process? So you were doing design based on measurements and monitoring and load testing. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you find the approval process for uh, yeah, yeah, actually getting? Yeah, but that was of course a, uh, a new to most. Uh, we had very good um, Collaboration with, with with the architect of the stadium KSH and um, and then in Denmark when you have buildings and the stadium is by all means a building even though it the structure standing outside and maybe look more like a bridge so to speak and being exposed to weather and wind then um, because people are staying there and not just walking by it's a building so to speak so you have to move through a process with a municipality uh, based on what's called the Anakin State Gardening or a approved um, structural um, structural uh, mechanical uh, improvement, approved uh, or say certified, um, and and that was of course a new process to to most. As by all means, we come from transport. We are working mostly with dynamic loading on bridges and other structures in the infrastructure world, and uh, the certified uh, structural uh, experts from from the world of buildings. Are not used to dynamic loading to the same degree, and in particular, not used to um, to uh, rehabilitation uh, in in that degree that we did here, and to base rehabilitation based on on on, on monitoring or something completely new. So that was an interesting process. We had a, a good collaboration with uh, with the certified uh, experts, uh, Bill Skilgo and 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 support. Were supported by Einar Ingolfsson from uh, KNI uh, in Denmark on, on the dynamic side. So that was that was it, it was a good collaboration, but it of course was a challenge and not something that's easily approached the first time. That's that should be said. Great. It seems that there are uh, well, there is one last question. Uh, Loile is asking any recommendations on how to include the dynamic loads of spectators in the stadium where there is no code of standards. Any lower or upper bounds? Yeah, but you can say that no. Oh, well, uh, you can say we, we moved by, by a, a, a DAF of 4.4 and that proved to be the case and covered it fairly well, also for high frequencies. Um, we measured a, a, a DAF of six, and that was uh, it. Still didn't fall down. You can argue, even though that the capacity was uh, was overutilized. If you follow the Danish standard, even though I'm arguing it's conservative for high frequencies, well, you have a very good first assumption. It might be that then you can discuss what happens with high frequencies, as we did in this case, and in particular for existing structures, it might be okay for various arguments. To not go all the way, but for new structures, of course, it's 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 not very costly to essentially just accept the standard as it is. So I would essentially look uh, towards international standards, um, and 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 by all means, it's a generic standard. It can be used for all structures, and 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 it, it's not it's not overly complicated to use. But of course, 
if you have done it before. So, so essentially, it is just to have a dynamic expert on your team. And a, and a follow up question to that one. Uh, let's say that your structure is sufficiently stiff. Mm. How much would you, which factor, or how much would you increase the static life load to take into account jumping on a stiff structure? Yeah, but that, that's a fair argument. So then we're starting to talk about pure impact. What happens if you jump on something that's completely stiff, like just the ground? But then, then, then the impact from your jump is still going to 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 uh, to increase the load of you. Um, stand on a like a, a weight, like a bath weight, as we call it in Danish, at least, or uh, on, the, on the ground in your in your living room at home and try to do it. Hope it doesn't break or anything like that. Have your kids do it, then it's probably a better chance that it doesn't break. At least for me, um, factor of two point five is 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 a, is a good assumption. You can get. 3, 3, and 3.2 in worst case. Uh, but that is if you are extremely good at jumping. Um, but but, but uh, pure impact of, of some, something around 2, 2 and a half is, is a conservative estimate. Uh, Linus has a specific question to one of your graphs. I would, yeah. like, I would like to ask about the PSD unit in the PSD versus frequency graph. I don't know which uh, page is on, unfortunately. On uh, yeah, it must be, um, if you go back, it must be B, B, uh, the unit here. Yeah. Um, now that is, by all means, I, 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 I have to uh, say I, it's not millimeters, it's not been scaled, but what which kind of scaling has been used, I, 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 I cannot recall at this point. I can get back to you on that. Okay. I think that's it. I think we're out of questions. Uh, then I would just, uh, on behalf of the Danish group of YAPS, uh, of course, thank you, Torben and Klaus, for the presentation and uh, thank all the participants for for joining i hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting uh, yeah and uh, please check out yaps's uh, homepage for webinars in the future there will be definitely be more to come so uh, yeah thank you all for your participation yes thank you